everybody and welcome to another ASMR history video. Yes, it's been way too long and finally, yes, we are back with another history video. I do want to be making these more regularly than I have been, but the important thing is we're back and we're going to be taking an educating and hopefully relaxing look at some history and as you can tell by the title, uh, the topic, the period of today's video is going to be the fall of the Roman Empire. This is the rise and fall of the Roman Empire is something I covered, I believe, in my second year of uni uh, in my history degree. But I have to say, while I was like refreshing and doing research again, like I, I didn't remember a lot. So <laughs> really useful module, evidently. But uh, yeah, we're going to be going over that now, some uh, sort of pre-warnings or stuff to say before we get into it. Well, when we say the fall of the Roman Empire, we're here concerned with the fall of the Western Roman Empire, because by the end it was West and East, but we'll get into that in, in due course. Um, and yeah, as I said, I learned about this a little bit, but my memory isn't fantastic, and I try to get my information from a variety of sources, but evidently I am not an expert. The sort of Cold War stuff and Vietnam War stuff, I knew more about this. A little bit more difficult, plus it's a, it's a lot further back than the, the previous ones that we had done. So, uh, yeah, but it should be good. I think the ones I'll do after this, I'll maybe do the classic World War I, World War II, but I want for, the, for this history video the first one back for a while, I wanted to go further back than we'd, we'd been before, so hopefully you find it interesting, hopefully you find it relaxing, and without further ado, let's get into the fall of the Roman Empire. So to begin, let's give a little bit of context to what the Roman Empire actually was, what are we talking about here? So according to tradition, the ancient city of Rome was founded in 753 BCE. It wasn't until 509 BCE, however, that the Roman Republic was founded. The Republic functioned effectively until civil war during the first century BCE led to the fall of the Republic and the creation of the Roman Empire in 27 CE. While the Roman Republic was a time of great advances in science, art and architecture, the fall of Rome refers to the end of the Roman Empire in 476 CE. Now just to give some, you know, some general definitions, because this might be a period of history which not a lot of people have, you know, explored before, to, to define what an empire is. An empire is a political system a group of people are ruled by a single individual, an emperor or an empress. At its height, in around 100 AD, the Roman Empire stretched from Britain in the northwest to Egypt in the southeast. So that's to kind of give you give you an idea of the kind of the size of the empire we're dealing with here. It wasn't it wasn't a small one. And to get a sense of how big that is, it's helpful to compare it to contemporary United States. The Roman provinces of Britain and Egypt were about as far apart as the American states of Florida and Washington. One obvious difference is that the Roman Empire had the Mediterranean in the middle of it, which helped move people and supplies over vast distances. Still, it's remarkable that emperors operating many centuries before the railroad and the telegraph, to say nothing of airplanes and the internet, were able to hold together such a vast domain for so long. So, when I was approaching this topic, it's really, really interesting, and there are so many aspects to it, and so many, in like, one individual puzzle could be a, a full video. So I figured let's focus on the fall of this great, this vast Roman Empire. And of course, a little precursor again, this won't be like an 
extensive list, I just had to sort of narrow it down, if you will, with the help of some articles and some timelines and stuff. But uh, there are some real key events and key timelines which overall contribute to the fall of Rome, the fall of the Western Roman Empire. So, with introductions to what we're dealing with done, let's get into the timeline of the fall of Rome. So, firstly, we have the crisis of the 3rd century in CE. So, this is also known as the period of military anarchy or the imperial crisis. This period began with the assassination of Severus Alexander, who ruled from 222 to 235, by his own troops. That was followed by nearly 50 years of chaos when military leaders wrestled one another for power. Rulers died of unnatural causes and there were revolts, plagues, fires and Christian persecutions. So the crisis of the 3rd century was the period in the history of the Roman Empire during which it splintered into three separate political entities, the Gallic Empire or Gaelic, the Roman Empire and the Bau breakaway empires, as well as the social turmoil and chaos which characterised the period, resulted from a number of factors. A shift in the paradigm of leadership following the assassination of Alexander Severus, increased participation by the military and politics, a lack of adherence to a clear policy of succession for emperors, inflation and economic depression caused by devaluation of currency under the Severan dynasty, increased pressure on the emperor to defend the provinces from invading tribes, and the plague, which heightened fears and destabilised communities. So, a lot of things going on there. After the assassination of Alexander Severus, the empire would see over 20 emperors rise and fall in the almost 50 years between 235 and 284 CE, as compared with the 26 emperors who reigned from the time of Augustus Caesar in 27 BCE to Severus 235 CE, a period of over 250 years. Well, the empire was restored through the efforts of Emperor Aurelian whose initiatives were developed further by Diocletian, who is credited with ending the crisis and ensuring the future survival of the empire. So, although the, the crisis of the 3rd century, or the Age of Chaos, didn't outright lead to the fall of Rome and the Roman Empire just yet, it created these sort of underlying cracks. The, what had been this vast, one solid empire had started to fragment into the smaller ones, so it sort of laid the foundations, it sort of set the empire up to fail in the future, so revealing its weaknesses, if you will. So, moving on to Diocletian and the Tetrarchy in 284-305, Diocletian secured the empire's borders and purged it of all threats to his power separated and enlarged the empire's civil and military services and reorganized the empire's provincial divisions, establishing the largest and most bureaucratic government in the history of the empire. Diocletian also restructured the Roman government by establishing the Tetrarchy, a system of rule in which four men shared rule over the massive Roman empire. The empire was effectively divided into two, with an Augustus and a subordinate Caesar in each half. Diocletian established administrative capitals for each of the Tetrarchs, which were located closer to the empire's borders. Though Rome retained its unique prefect of the city, it was no longer the administrative capital. So, when in 305 the 20-year term of Diocletian and Maximian ended, both 
abdicated their Caesars, Galerius and Constantius Glorus. I tell you what, just a quick side note, uh, the Roman age has a lot of great names for ASMR, so that's a big plus. Um, anyways, both were raised to the rank of Augustus and two new Caesars were appointed, Maximinus and Flavius Valerius Severus. Well, that's a, that's a pick a name, mate, don't have three. And these four formed the second Tetrarchy. However, the system broke down very quickly thereafter. When Constantius died in 306, Galerius promoted Severus to Augustus, while, Constan while Constantine, Constantius' son, was proclaimed Augustus by his father's troops. At the same time, Maxentius, the son of Maximian, who also resented being left out of the new arrangements, defeated Severus, before forcing him to abdicate and then arranging his murder in 307. Maxentius and Maximian both then declared themselves Augusti. By 308, there were therefore no fewer than four claimants to the rank of Augustus, and only one to that of Caesar. So, by 313, overall, that was a lot of names and a lot of politics, a lot of family bickering. So, the outcome of this, by 313, therefore, there remained only two emperors, Constantine in the west and Licinius in the east. The, tetra the tetrarchic system, sorry, was at an end, although it took until 324 for Constantine to finally defeat Licinius, reunite the two halves of the Roman Empire and declare himself sole Augustus. So again, like with the first event, it's sort of laying the foundations for a split, um, undermining its overall power. Next, 306 to 337, we have the acceptance of Christianity, and in brackets, the Milvian Bridge event. So, the age of Constantine marked a distinct a distinct epoch in the history of the Roman Empire, both for founding Byzantium in the East, as well as his adoption of Christianity as a state religion. Eusebius of Caesarea and other Christian sources record that Constantine, I keep alternating how I say his name, I'm not sure if it's Constantine or Constantine, they record that Constantine experienced a dramatic event in 312 at the Battle of Milvian Bridge, after which Constantine claimed the emperorship in the West and converted to Christianity. The Battle of the Milvian Bridge took place between the Roman emperors Constantine I and Maxentius on October 28, 312. It takes its name from the Milvian Bridge, an important route over the Tiber. Constantine won the battle and started on the path that led him to end the Tetrarchy and become the sole ruler of the Roman Empire. Maxentius drowned in the Tiber during the battle and his body was later taken from the river and decapitated. Lovely. According to chroniclers such as Eusebius of Caesarea and Lactantius, the battle marked the beginning of Constantine's conversion to Christianity. Apparently, Constantine looked up to the sun before the battle and saw a cross of light above it, and with the Greek words in this sign, conquer, often rendered in Latin version, in oxygno vinces. I've probably butchered that, but I don't read or speak Latin, so... Constantine commanded his troops to adorn their shields with a Christian symbol, and therefore, they were, thereafter, they were victorious. The Arch of Constantine, erected in celebration of the victory, certainly attributes Constantine's success to divine intervention. However, the monument does not, dis does not display any overtly Christian symbolism, so there is actually no scholarly consensus on the event's relation to Constantine's conversion to Christianity, so the idea of him having this vision is disputed and not actually historically properly proven, but it's popular belief. Following the battle, Constantine, Dean, Dine, ignored the altars to the god 
gods prepared on the Capitoline and did not carry out the customary sacrifices to celebrate a general's victorious entry into Rome, instead heading directly to the imperial palace. Most influential people in the empire, however, especially, especially high military officials, had not been converted to Christianity and still participated in the traditional religions of Rome. Constantine's rule exhibit, exhibited at least a willingness to appease these factions. The Roman coins minted up to eight years after the battle still bore the images of Roman gods. The monuments he first commissioned, such as the Arch of Constantine, contained no reference to Christianity. While the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great reigned from 306 to 337, Christianity began to transition to the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. Historians remain uncertain about Constantine's reasons for favouring Christianity, and theologians and historians have argued about which form of early Christianity he subscribed to. There is no consensus among scholars as to whether he adopted his mother Helena's Christianity or encouraged her to convert to the faith himself. Some scholars question the extent to which he should be considered a Christian emperor, and I actually think that might have been um, like an exam or essay question I had to do at uni. Doesn't really have too much to do with, you know, the facts, but I, I thought I'd throw that in there, so you're welcome. Constantine's decision to cease the persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire was a turning point of early Christianity, sometimes referred to as the triumph of the church, the peace of the church, or the Constantinian shift. In 313, Constantine and Licinius issued the Edict of Milan decriminalizing Christian worship. The emperor became a great patron of the church and set a precedent for the position of the Christian emperor within the church and the notion of orthodoxy, Christendom, ecumen ecumenical councils, gosh, and the state church of the Roman Empire declared by edict in 380. He is revered as a saint and in the eastern he is, revered, he is revered as a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church and Oriental Orthodox Church for his example as a Christian monarch. So, I bet so basically up to this point, paganism has been the more the, the prevalent, the most popular religion in the Roman Empire. Basically, the belief in multiple multiple Roman gods. But here we see whether you have this vision of the battle or not. We see a direct a direct sort of uh, transition to Christianity as the main religion. Apologies if you can hear my laptop going absolutely ballistic. I think it's I think it's reaching the end of its of its life. But um, anyways, moving swiftly on. Three sixty to three sixty three, we have the fall of official paganism. As I just mentioned, paganism being the most popular religion. So the Roman Emperor Julian. Uh, known as Julian the Apostate, attempted to reverse the religious trend to Christianity with a return to paganism supported by the government. He actually failed and died in the East fighting the Parthians. So in 363, when Julian died, he was succeeded by Jovian, a Christian emperor. No other pagan emperor gained the power before the Roman state outlawed pagan practices. Even so, 1,700 years later, we continue to be a predominantly Christian society in terms of our beliefs. It may have been the pagan attitude of religious tolerance that prevailed. Yeah, that's a bit of a, that's a, bit of a debate in itself, isn't it? Are we truly a Christian sort of nation, or are we in fact paganistic? Is that the right word? But yeah, so the fall of official paganism comes with the death of Julian, who is the last pagan emperor. Now, on August 9th, 378, we have the Battle of Adrianople. Bad intelligence gathering and the unwarranted confidence of Emperor Valens led to the worst Roman defeat since Hannibal's victory at the Battle of Cannae. On August 9th, AD 378, Valens was killed 
and his army lost to an army of Goths, led by Fritigern, whom Valens had given permission only two years earlier to settle in Roman territory. Now, when we talk about Goths, we don't mean uh, long black hair drinking cans of monster listening to screamer music in the statues in town. No, they're sort of like a group of settlers um, who, as it says here, were allowed to settle in the Roman Empire. Uh, I believe, like, Visigoths came from, like, Spain. Not Goths, maybe Germany, but don't quote me on that. But they, they came from other places, basically. Uh, not Rome, if that makes sense. But there's probably a much better explanation for that. So, you know, don't be using that quote. Don't be quoting Jacob in your, in your exams. <laughs> So next we have the division of Rome. So in 364, a year after the death of Julian, the apostate emperor, Valens was made co-emperor with his brother Valentinian. They chose to split the territory, with Valentinian taking the west and Valens the east, a division that was to continue. Valentinian had had a successful military career prior to being elected emperor. But Valens, who had only joined the military in the 360s, had not. Valens tries to reclaim land lost to the Persians. So, since his predecessor had lost eastern territory to the Persians, Valens set out to reclaim it, but revolts within the Eastern Empire kept him from completing his mission. One of the revolts was caused by the usurper Procopius, a relative of the last line of Constantine, Julian because of a claimed relationship with the family of the still popular Constantine, Procopius persuaded many of Valens' troops to defect. But in 366, Valens defeated Procopius and sent his head to his brother, Valentinian. Next in this story, Valens makes a treaty with the Goths, so the Davingi Goths, led by their king, Athanaric, had planned to attack Valens' territory, but when they learned of Procopius's plans, they became his allies instead. Following his defeat of Procopius, Valens intended to attack the Goths, but was prevented, first by their flight, but then by a spring flood the next year. However, Valens persisted and defeated the Davingi and the Grothungi, both Goths, in 369. They concluded a treaty quickly, which allowed Valens to set to work on the still missing Eastern Persian territory. Unfortunately, troubles throughout the empire diverted his attention, and in 374, he had deployed troops to the west and was faced with a military manpower shortage. In 375, the Huns pushed the Goths out of their homelands. The Grothungi and Davingi Goths appealed to Valens for a place to live. Valens, seeing this as an opportunity to increase his military, agreed to admit into Thrace of those Goths who were led by their chieftain Fritigern, but not the other group of Goths, including those led by Athanaric, who had conspired against him before, so he's let some, some of the Goths into the empire to settle on. But some not, which, you know, understandable. However, we then come on to the death of Valens. Two-thirds of the eastern army were killed, according to Amanius, putting an end to 16 divisions. Valens was among the casualties. Well, like most of the details of the battle, the details of Valens' demise are not known with any certainty. However, it is thought that Valens was either killed towards the end of the battle or wounded, escaped to a nearby farm, and there was burnt to death by Gothic marauders. I suppose a survivor brought the story to the Romans. It is worth noting that this catastrophic Roman defeat occurred in the Eastern Empire, despite this fact, and the fact that among the precipitating factors of the fall of Rome, Barbarian invasions must rank very high. The fall of Rome, barely a century later in AD 476, did not occur within the Eastern Empire. So, yeah, it, this... I'm trying to get my head around this because this, like, extract is a, bit, is a bit wordy. But, yeah, this occurred in the Eastern Empire. But, obviously, when we talk about the fall of Rome, we're talking about the... Um, obviously in the west but i think it's just to illustrate um barbarian invasions also occurred in, in the west but this 
this was just one of the most, like, catastrophic defeats, embarrassing defeats, which, you know, led to these settlers re-obtaining, you know, more power, greater influence uh, in, um, in the empire, whether that be east or west. Now, moving on, in 379 to 395, we have an east-west split. After Valens's death, Theodosius ruled 379 to 395, briefly reunited the empire, but it didn't last beyond his reign. At his death, the empire was divided by his sons Arcadius in the east and Honorius in the west. Then we have the sack of Rome, 401 to 410. Rome, once the capital of the world, is now the grave of the Roman people, wrote St. Jerome of a cataclysm that no one could have predicted. After several generations of Roman superiority and arrogance, the Visigothic barbarian mercenaries reminded their erstwhile masters of where the real military power lay. Alaric, the leader of the Visigoths, had been left embittered by the experience at the Battle of Frigidus. For years he waged war on the Eastern Roman Empire, yet the Western Empire feared the Visigoths' anger do so much that in 402 the Romans moved their capital from Rome to the more readily defensible Ravenna in northeastern Italy. That same year, Alaric invaded Italy but was turned back by the great general Flavius Stilicho at Palencia in Piedmont. Another Gothic warlord, Radagasus, was stopped by Stilicho in 406, but the Visigoths kept coming. The, by 408, Alaric was back in Italy besieging Rome. Even now, the Romans hoped to bring the tenacious Visigoths back into harness as defenders of the empire. That's a bit ambitious. Several barbarian peoples, from Germanic warriors such as the Vandals and Swaves, to the Asiatic nomads such as the Alans and the Huns, had crossed the Rhine and now roamed and ransacked at will beyond the Alps. Alaric was ready to compromise with Rome. He offered to spare the city in return for the promise of an annual payment and a place in the official military hierarchy of the Empire. Yet, with Rome itself at stake, Emperor Honorius refused. On the night of the 21st of August, 410, rebel slaves, a southern official, or some other unknown, unknown party, quietly opened the gates of Rome to admit the Visigoths. They embarked on a three-day spree of plunder and destruction that left the eternal city a smoking ruin. This is often a date given for the official fall of Rome. So what had previously been the centre of the empire, the capital, was ruins because of all these uh, settling groups who wanted to remind their, their not owners but their rulers where the real power lay and I'd say they were pretty, pretty effective in, you know, conveying their message. Sacking Rome isn't, you know, isn't a bad feat. Now, we have more attacks from, from these groups. So, in 429 to 435, the Vandals sack North Africa. Vandals under Kaiseric, King of the Vandals and Alans, attacked Northern Africa, cutting off the grain supply to the Romans. In 440 to 454, the Huns attack. The Central Asian Huns, led by their king, Attila, yes, from Night of the Museum, threatened Rome. They were paid off, but then they attacked again. And then in 455, the Vandals sack Rome. Vandals plunder Rome, amounting to the fourth sack of the city. But by an agreement with Pope Leo I, they injure few people. So that's nice of them. They sacked the city, but they, they spared the people. And finally, all of these things, the divisions, the, the violence, the battles, and the changes in religion lead to this. 476, the fall of the emperor of Rome. Romulus Augustulus, in form. Flavius Romulus Romulus. 
Lucas Augustulus. Smash that. Known to history as the last of the Western Roman emperors. In fact, he was a usurper and puppet, not recognised as a legitimate ruler by the Eastern Emperor. Interesting. Romulus was the son of the Western Empire's master of soldier, soldiers, Orestes. His original surname was Augustus, but it was changed to the diminutive because he was still a child when his father, after driving the Western Emperor Julius Nepos from Italy, elevated him to the throne on October 31st, 475. For about 12 months, Orestes ruled Italy in his son's name, but eventually his troops mutinied and found a leader in the German warrior Odosa, Odoka, butchering these well. Odosa's forces captured and executed Orestes on August 28, 476. Romulus, however, was spared because of his youth. Odega gave him a pension and sent him to live with his relatives in Campania, a region of southern Italy. His subsequent fate is unknown. A comment by Cassiodorus may suggest that he survived until the rule of Theodoric, which was 493 to 526. So the young puppet emperor is deposed, and that really marks the end of the Western Roman Empire as, as it know as it was known really uh, what we've done in this video is highlighted just a few of the, um, the key events which led to its unfolding and its unraveling and its demise in 476 um, as I mentioned you know a bit rough around the edges with the facts and stuff and obviously try my best to be as accurate as possible but if you're an expert feel free to you know educate and help in the comments but Regardless of that, hopefully you found this relaxing and informative, even if it's the wrong information, but I'm pretty confident it's not. <laughs> Do let me know any suggestions for future, the future periods, events you'd like to see covered. Like I said, I think I'll do the World Wars next one and two, just because it gives me clear ones to aim for, because half of the, most of my time uh, planning these videos is spent on an hour about what period or event to do, so, so yeah, do leave your suggestions down below, please, if you did enjoy, leave a like, these videos are a little bit more effort to make and to edit, so a like really helps me out and I appreciate it massively, and yeah, do subscribe if you're new, there'll be plenty more history videos coming soon, soon I think we're doing a, a fascinating figures on Albert Einstein, so keep your eyes peeled for that, but guys, thank you so much for listening, and